Wonder, curiosity, connection. Where will your adventures take you? I'm Dr. Diane, and thank you for joining me on today's episode of Adventures in Learning. So welcome to this edition of Adventures in Learning. I am so fortunate to have science teacher extraordinaire Lynn Warre Coles on today. Lynn has been a friend of mine for more years than we'll talk about here on this podcast. (laughs) And I'm going to start by having her tell you a little bit about herself. So Lynn. Hi, everybody. I'm Lynn Coles. I'm a science teacher. I have uh, very many previous lives, uh, but it all comes into uh, my joy and my passion of exploring the natural world. So that's a great segue, Lynn, into my very first question, which I'm sort of asking everybody. When you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, I am fortunate to have a mother who recorded all of that. And I have a book and um, in the first uh, kindergarten, one, two, three, four, five, there's probably 25 different entries. Um, But at three, I stated to everyone, according to the journal, that I was going to be an entomologist. And I actually stuck with that along with all the other things like nurse, firefighter, all the other things, um, gymnast, gymnast. I was a firefighting ballerina, so I guess. Yes, exactly. But then when I got to be, I don't know, five or six, and I started to look into such things using the World Book Encyclopedia, most entomologists work um, with pest control companies with their goal being to eliminate insects. And that just broke my heart. I was like, well, I can't be an entomologist. So um, I never did decide. And when I went to college, the first two years, I changed my major five times. And I ended up with English as a major and I'm a science teacher. So I'm obviously one of those folks that likes a little bit of everything. Well, it just means that your learning adventure is ongoing. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And that's the way it should be for all of us, I think, right? (laughs) Yeah. Talking to somebody else whose learning adventure is ongoing. (laughs) We would be stagnant otherwise. Exactly. So another question I like to ask is, do you remember what your favorite book was when you were a kid? Oh, it's so hard to pick favorites. Um, two immediately popped to mind. V- visuals. Um, the Dog Party at the end of Go Dog Go. Um, that book was such an adventure. And you just gathered all kinds of friends, you know, big ones, little ones, spotted ones, striped ones. I mean, from the neighborhood, from the town, you gathered all your friends and you ended up at this massive adventure. I mean, I could just pick my, picture myself up there. All the little details, you know, the picnic and the playing badminton and all of that. Um, I, I think the things I liked most were about adventure and about exploring other places. Um, the other one that comes to mind is uh, my parents gave me when I was five, a copy of Richard Scarry's busy, busy world. Yes. And I traveled all through the world with those characters and, um, continue to love that, all that detail, all that adventure, all those different animals in this case, exploring and having, you know, some, having some mistakes, <laughs> putting too many people in the Tokyo subway, you know? but, um, but, you know, being with each other and enjoying that community. So. Of course. And, you know, you talked about wanting to be an entomologist when you were young. Um, <laughs> so clearly science was something that has been important to you all the way along. Are there specific moments you remember from your childhood, like moments of wonder? I, um, wonder is a great word. Um, I, I, I would consider it one of my theme words and especially finding wonder in the ordinary, in the outside, in the natural world. Um, I, my parents tell a story and I actually recall this. Um, I grew up in Florida, so lots of bugs. Um, unfortunately you go out in the same yards and you find just a fraction of that diversity of life that were in the yards, especially with frogs, toads, and insects. So, so it saddens me, but, um, I wasn't scared of anything. And, and, and I had friends, I had imaginary friends, um, a dragon and an octopus. And I had all these creatures that were my friends and I would pick them up and talk to them and carry them around. And I came in the house one time with, to tell, to listen to the story, something like, 13 daddy long legs all on my arms and (laughs) came in and said, mom, look at my new friends and into the house. And, um, I didn't know this at the time. And this is a testament to my mother, but she was deathly afraid of spiders. And 
I don't even remember exactly. I remember being diverted and I'm going back outside. Something like they need their mommies. You need to take them back outside so that they're not away from their mommies. <laughs> you know, they were going to come to lunch. And, um, you know, given the, um, given the freedom to explore like that, I mean, I spent a long time on my belly looking at the grasshopper nose to nose, you know, catching the cicadas up in the maple tree, um, rescuing the Katie did from the spider's web and just, catching all the frogs and toads and um, getting stung by some things as well, but just having the freedom to explore. I, I fear for our youngest generation that not only are those that diversity of life isn't out there, but we don't take the time. We don't find the wonder to get out there, get off our screens, familiar refrain, and just really connect with the natural world in that way. So I you wish know, I could take a little sense. bit connected in. <laughs> I I remember riding my bike and sort of roaming as a child and I've mm-hmm. given I've given my parents grief about the fact that I was <laughs> responsible for a 3-year-old at the age of 6. Um I'm sure there were adults around, I just don't remember it. But what you're Yay. saying about noticing the natural world, mm-hmm. um I remember some of that as a kid. I'm actually mm-hmm. rediscovering that now. And mm-hmm. so I find that it's almost like it's a first time for so many of these Mm -hmm. things that I'm taking walks and I'm paying attention Mm -hmm. to the idea that the seeds are on the trees and, oh, this is the Mm -hmm. time of year for us where the acorns are starting to come out or watching the insects in the yard and looking at the pollinators a little more closely. And so maybe that's part of what we're sparking as educators is that sense of wonder in ourselves and hopefully Mm -hmm. that sense of wonder in our students as well. Exactly, exactly. Very cool. So thinking of sense of wonder, thinking about um, STEM and STEAM, Mm -hmm. um, this is a question that I've been thinking about a lot lately because the term itself didn't really come into play in the United States until the early 2000s. But as Mm -hmm. a teacher, I remember connecting science and technology and Mm -hmm. engineering and art and math Mm -hmm. all together when I was teaching elementary school. When's the first time you remember sort of encountering the concept of STEM or STEAM? Well, it's interesting because in middle school, I started doing science projects and they were very, they were either biological or biochemical, um, very traditional science projects. And, but our regional and national and international science fairs were STEM fairs. And so I met students from all over that were working on projects that weren't just about the estuary like mine was or about a catalyst and a chemical reaction like another one of mine was and engineering projects, math projects even. And so that was my first experience with STEM without hearing that word STEM. Um, And I've also been an elementary school teacher. And the thing about having a self-contained classroom is that you know, you have the same group of students and you're teaching them all the content areas. So you're teaching them science, you're teaching them technology, engineering, math, language arts, um, social studies, all of that. And it's most effective when you can make connections between those things. Otherwise, it really doesn't make sense. You know, here's this lesson in isolation, you know? And so um, I think uh, any teacher, especially an elementary school teacher that's self-contained like that, is, is applying that concept. I didn't hear STEAM with the arts, even though in elementary schools, we were doing that until only very recently. And um, in, in the secondary schools, we actually, here in Florida, we actually offer a STEM class, that, that, but not a STEAM class, but you're just now seeing, and primarily in private and charter schools, you're seeing STEAM programs. I have several colleagues this year who are starting up STEAM programs in elementary schools or in a um, ones in a K through eight. Uh, but they, these are brand new positions. They're like creating those positions as they go this year. So it's really very new um, with the, with the language. Right. And that's exciting when you think about that as a vehicle for helping to build those connections and mm-hmm. to give teachers the empowerment 
to do Mm -hmm. what we know are best practices in terms of linking things together. And then for me, the other piece is looking at that marvelous world of children's literature and -hmm. connecting diverse picture books back into that, because those picture books work whether you're in elementary school or whether you're teaching middle school or high school. They're Mm -hmm. fabulous mentor texts that we can use to sort of spark kids' Mm -hmm. interest, let them see themselves reflected, and then carry those connections forward. And if you're having an adventure through the books, then you make that connection to the real world, the natural world, and you're having that adventure in life. You're having that adventure in real life. And I think that's very powerful. Absolutely. And that's a great spot for us to stop. We're going to go to a break. And when we come back, we're going to learn a little bit more about your adventure in learning. Hey, early childhood and elementary school teachers and librarians, are you looking for ways to spice up your curriculum, build connections with engaged STEAM learners, and introduce multicultural versions of fairy tales and folk literature? If so, head over to drdianeadventures.com and check out our on-demand virtual course. Beyond Ever After STEAM on-demand virtual course allows you to work at your own pace and learn how to build these STEM STEAM connections through multicultural fairy tales and folk literature. You'll receive professional development credits after you complete this high-energy three-hour on-demand course produced with Steve Spangler, Inc. As a bonus, you're going to receive a PDF that's filled with curriculum connections and program ideas you can put to work immediately in your early childhood elementary or library setting. Discounts are available for group purchases, plus you get special pricing when you purchase it as part of a regular professional development workshop. So head on over to drdianeadventures.com and get started on your own Beyond Ever After experience. All right, we are back. And so, um, Lynn, I have so loved sort of looking into childhood influences on (laughs) your science, STEAM, STEM journey. And what I'm wondering is, can you describe a little bit more? You talked about how everything sort of happened in a spiral, that you've tried all Mm -hmm. these different things. So can you tell us a little bit more about your adventures in learning? What do you currently do and how did you get to that point? Um, what I currently do is very simple. I'm a middle school science teacher. How I got to that point is a complicated spider's web. Um, I've tried all different kinds of things. Um, I have uh, worked in community organizing, in volunteer management, um, in national service programs where you and I connected for the first time. Um, I've been a Navy wife, a mom of three. Um, I have um, worked as an IT uh, account manager, um, and I have taught from second grade up through eighth grade. Um, And so, you know, what I think a lot, you know, especially if you're trying to build a resume or try to communicate succinctly to someone else, you know, what connects all of this? Um, Community building, a community building and a connection with the world. Um, If we want to engage students, we have to interest them and we have to show them that it's meaningful to them. If we want to engage volunteers, it's the same thing. If we want someone to purchase something that costs a lot of money to support their business, it's it's the same thing. And so the different kinds of things I have done are all about bringing people together and and for a positive effect to in this community we call Earth. So I always liked the um, the bumper sticker, you know, think globally, act locally. And that's what I feel like I've done as I've moved all around this beautiful country and this world. So it sounds like you're able to take all the connections and the community building that you've learned from all of these different tasks and bring them into the classroom. Yes, so I'm an are, interdisciplinary person. <laughs> so what does it mean to build those kinds of connections in the classroom? Like, how do you go about doing that? Well, there's there's layers upon layers. There's the student's relationship to each other, to the teacher, instructors, the relationship between them and the content, and the relationship between them and their school community and greater community. So in in, I mean... Research shows that in order to engage students in school, that they have to be, they have to achieve success and they have to have fun doing it. 
And so how do you define those things? We do a lot of celebrating, um, celebrating success, you know, a lot of formative, um, you know, how are we, where are we, what are we doing and finding your place. That's all about finding your place in the world and the community. And you're going to do those things with each other in different ways. Um, so if you have a classroom where they can experience things with their hands, with their minds, together with other people and f- find a way to enjoy that and to see why it's relevant, then you're going to learn without even realizing you're doing so, you know, like we all do as we go through our lives. Absolutely. And I was lucky enough to get to be in your classroom this um, past (laughs) spring. And so I saw all of the children's literature that you had around the room. Can you offer like just a couple of examples of ways that even with your middle school students, you connect children's (laughs) literature to the science and STEM that you teach? Well, and other teachers, particularly language arts teachers, are surprised to see that. I think in some ways it started coming from an elementary school background because having a classroom library is just assumed in an elementary school classroom. In a middle school classroom, it is not common at all, even in the language arts classrooms for lots of reasons. And we have a great, you know, we have a library, we have a media center, um, but um, What is so challenging and what I see in this generation of students that have grown up with devices is that they have very short attention spans. And in order to understand science, there's a lot of vocabulary. There's a lot of reading. I mean, sixth and seventh and eighth grade science are, you know, lay the backbone for all of those high test classes that you take in high school, chemistry, physics, biology, marine biology, all of that. And Um, if you can't read, it's a challenge. And so, um, I, I have built my classroom library of nonfiction texts of all levels. I mean, some of them are ones from my childhood, you know, why don't haircuts hurt? I mean, things that will bring them in. Um, but, uh, I also have, uh, a fiction library and, you know, that's something that students can choose to do as part of their work in my classroom. In Florida, we have something called the Sunshine State Books, um, which hopefully will continue, and uh, where, uh, say, 16 books are chosen, and they announce them. They're usually Florida authors. And then our fabulous media specialist does incentives and prizes, and, you know, you read five, you read 10, and all this sort of stuff. And and there's a battle of the books between the schools, and and a lot of excitement around it. Well, I read them every summer as well and have some of the copies in my book. And there are things like a science fiction book all about potions where they're combining things. And we get into fantastic conversations in the class. Well, okay, have you read this Sunshine State book? Could, could that really happen? What laws of physics do they defy? You know, and, and the same thing with big canons like Harry Potter and um, uh, you know, all the fantastic beasts. Could, could that survive? Is that an adaptation? Is that a symbiotic relationship? Um, you know, the science of Star Wars, you know, well, what would happen if the planets were aligned with two moons? You know, what's what's holding that in place? <laughs> you know? So try to make those connections with the world of fiction and science fiction and the world of science. Very cool. You know, I was thinking that when I was working in museum education, Mm -hmm. I would go out and I was working with kids between the ages of preschool and eighth grade and Mm -hmm. would do different lessons. And I'd usually have about 30 minutes with a group of kids, Mm -hmm. but I always tried to connect it back to some sort of book. And so, for example, when I was teaching about water and point and non-point source pollution, I used Mm -hmm. we're a water protector or we are the water protectors um, because it's such a gorgeous book um, and it opened up questions for them in terms of climate action, in terms of being Mm -hmm. citizens of the world, as well as looking more closely at the water around where they lived. Mm -hmm. Is there a book that, you know, just lights you on fire that you think this is one I love using when I teach? Oh, gosh. Um, No, but I love it when students bring it to me. You know, it's like, what are you reading? And how does that connect with, um, um, how does that connect with what we're doing? And um, I'm a candy classroom. So it's like, oh, you know, bring it in here and let's talk about it and share it with the class. And, you know, I I try to incent that behavior. Um, But uh, um, 
I can't think of a specific one that I, that I use a lot. Thank you for indulging me in one of my favorite topics. I love exploring ways that books can be used to enhance STEAM learning. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to explore learning adventures and how they connect to the future. Hey, early childhood and elementary school teachers and librarians, are you looking for ways to spice up your curriculum, build connections with engaged STEAM learners, and introduce multicultural versions of fairy tales and folk literature? If so, head over to drdianadventures.com and check out our on-demand virtual course. Beyond Ever After STEAM on-demand virtual course allows you to work at your own pace and learn how to build these STEM STEAM connections through multicultural fairy tales and folk literature. You'll receive professional development credits after you complete this high-energy three-hour on-demand course produced with Steve Spangler, Inc. As a bonus, you're going to receive a PDF that's filled with curriculum connections and program ideas you can put to work immediately in your early childhood elementary or library setting. Discounts are available for group purchases, plus you get special pricing when you purchase it as part of a regular professional development workshop. So head on over to drdianadventures.com and get started on your own Beyond Ever After experience. Welcome back. While we were on break, Lynn and I were talking about some children's picture books that might connect to this wonderful conversation. And I was thinking in terms of entomologists who have inquisitive minds and look at ways to learn about insects in order to be able to study the natural world and look at cause and effect. One of the best books I've discovered is Buzzing with Questions, The Inquisitive Mind of Charles Henry Turner. It's a beautiful picture book biography by Janice N. Harrington, illustrated by Theodore Taylor III. I'll include a link to that one. Some other books that you might be interested in terms of encouraging wonder as you're going outside. Um, What's in Your Pocket? Collecting Nature's Treasures. It's Heather L. Montgomery, illustrated by Maribel Lashuga. It reminds me so much of the things that Lynn did as a child. And a couple other books that you might want to think about as well. Um, Ada Twist Scientist. Andrea Beatty and David Roberts. It's a great one for your budding scientists and looking at some um, ways that you can encourage that exploration in kids. Um, A current new favorite of mine is Fairy Science. It's by Ashley Spires. She wrote The Most Magnificent Thing. And this one is lovely because all the fairies in the woods think that everything happens due to magic. And our heroine, goes out to prove that science is part of it. And so the scientific process is embedded into this wonderful book about fairies and nature. It's a great read. And then finally, the one I referenced is We Are Water Protectors. It's by Carol Lindstrom, illustrated by Michaela Goad. And it's a beautiful book for exploring um, the power that we all have to be able to protect the water. So those are our picture book connections this week. Let's resume our conversation. So Lynn, let's think about ways we can take this amazing conversation about connections beyond your classroom. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received from a mentor teacher? I, my first teaching mentor said that you need to think about the student in your classroom that is the most challenging to you. (laughs) And uh, we all know who that person is to ourselves. And are you reaching him or her? And how? And is there something you could be doing differently that, because you're reaching the folks that are easy and you're reaching maybe these other trouble kids, but what about this one kid that has a block of some kind or family situation or just talks all the time or whatever it is that is your personal gets you, you know, are you reaching that student? Um, Another another piece of advice that I think of um, is the importance of reflection and the way she stated it was, at the end of each day, think about, would you have liked to have been in your, a student in your classroom today? Why or why not? And if the answer is no, what could you do differently? And, and reflection is so important. And Lynn, I know you've also been a mentor teacher um, mm-hmm. for many other teachers. So what mm-hmm. advice do you give them? <sighs> Find your people. <laughs> Find your people, share with them, 
and you're no one, and this is not just teaching advice, but you're, you're not in this alone. You're not in this alone. And even if you're an introvert, you know, here's a great book <laughs> that'll help you with that. If you don't want to talk to me about it. Um, it's, it's hard to go through this world. It's very challenging to be a teacher in the current environment. Um, if you can find your people and the same thing that is shown to help students succeed is what will help parents succeed. I mean, uh, teachers succeed, you know, what, how can you do this with people that you enjoy and have fun doing it? You're going to have success at the end. So again, it's all about building those connections. We need them Absolutely. probably now more than ever in terms mm-hmm. of connections with one another, connections with the world around mm-hmm. us, um, mm-hmm. building those positive connections that help us get through yes. the day. Mm-hmm. So um, that's actually a great segue to the next question I was going to ask. <laughs> What's something that currently brings you joy? Oh, gosh. Um, well, there's the tangible and the intangible. So um, the tangible is, and I don't know why I didn't know about this already, but I discovered this summer this app by iNaturalist called Seek. And all you do is you take your phone and you point it towards some living thing. And it tells you what it is, its species, its <laughs> genus, and it tells you what it is. And I mean, I spent a lot of time out in my garden or in the woods or, or at the beach, which I'm lucky to be able to do here in Florida, and observing and making observations. And I talk to my students all the time about how observing is a scientific process. And we work on ways to hone that and make ourselves stronger observers. But you know, here's in the palm of your hand, the universe. And so um, there's my plug for Seek by iNaturalist. And you know what? We'll go ahead and put a link to that in the story notes. So as far as the intangible, what brings me joy is, and you, it's interesting you brought this word up in the very beginning of our conversation, is the idea of wonder or awe. Um, a few years back, I read an article by a cognitive cognitive behavior therapist about um, seeking wonder and and how good that was for your psyche, um, your mental health. And and she gave a variety of examples and um, of ways that you could seek and find wonder in your life, you know, slow down, look around you. And number one was get outside. So something that really resonated to me. And by the way, one of the other things on the list was spend time with children. So, <laughs> so you're doing both. So let's see if we can get outside with a book and spend some time with children, then we've hit the trifecta <laughs> and there's wonder around us everywhere. But I just love it. Um, yes, yesterday or the day before we, uh, when we had a big thunderstorm come through right in the evening, um, there was a, just the most spectacular sunset that, that you've ever seen. And all of a sudden social media was flooded with pictures of the sunset. So just think, Thousands of people were standing outside, just looking up at the sky. And, and I just, I, that, that just brings me joy. That is awesome. <laughs> I love that. What was the name of that book? Um, the, um, it was an article I read. Um, I will try to find it for you. Awesome. And we'll look for it and we'll put it you. in the story notes for you guys. All right. All right. So that leads me to sort of my final question. Um, what makes you hopeful? As a human, as a teacher, (laughs) teenagers, I bet that's not the answer you were expecting. (laughs) I love it though. Tell me why teenagers make you hopeful. So I have a teenager in my house and I spend time with her peers and I teach teenagers and I volunteer with teenagers. And so I'm around a variety of different kinds of teenagers and they are, despite all of the situations in our world and what they've gone through um, in the last couple of years with COVID and their school environment in particular, they are optimistic. They are hopeful. They are engaged in the world. They have found ways to use these fantastic technologies that are at our fingertips to engage with each other across the world, across the country. They're connecting over musical taste. They're connecting over art. They're, you know, selling each other. They're used t-shirts and connecting over, you know, fashions and, and 
And in very thoughtful ways, I mean, whether that's political advocacy or sharing music and creating art or, um, or um, you know, talking about text. I mean, there's so many ways that they are talking to each other. And so they're building connections. They're using the, the tools that, you know, we never had growing up. To, they're using their tools and they're building community. They're building connections. And I just, I find that fantastic. Lynn Coles, science teacher extraordinaire. Thank you again for being on Adventures in Learning. And thank you for reminding us of the power of community building and connection in the classroom and outside of it. You've been listening to the Adventures in Learning podcast with your host, Dr. Diane. If you love the Adventures in Learning podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review. We can't wait to see you for our next Adventure in Learning.